Hello everyone and welcome to the Green Couch Reviews. There's an old saying I'm sure you're all familiar with. Truth is stranger than fiction. That goes doubly so when the person telling you this so-called truth is none other than Mr. Orson Welles. And even more so when the truth in question is all about liars, frauds, and forgers. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you F for Fake. Released in 1974, F for Fake was the last major film directed by cinema legend Orson Welles, the man responsible for such classics as Citizen Kane, The Trial, Touch of Evil, and many others. In this case, he's not only the director, but also co-writer, and our inestimable guide through what appears at first glance to be a biography of Elmire de Horry, an artist specializing in the paintings of other artists, which is to say a professional art forger. According to Elmire, and corroborated by his biographer Clifford Irving, who also appears in the film, he is responsible for thousands of the great masterpieces that adorn the walls of museum exhibits the world over, all of which went right under the collective noses of the very best art experts. I would like to see any expert or any museum director or any art dealer who know which one is a Matisse and which one is by Elmire. and I'm ready to accept the challenge. Or at least that's what he claims. As I said earlier, truth is stranger than fiction. In the case of this particular documentary, the truth gets very, very strange indeed. The movie is made up to a large extent from footage shot by French director and cinematographer François Reichenbach, who filmed the actual interviews with De Horry, Irving, and others in the context of an unfinished documentary about art forgery. He took what he had and brought it to Wells so that they could work together and make a finished film out of it. And it's at this point that they, along with the rest of the world, discovered that they didn't have just one faker on their hands, that they had two. Here's what happened. In 1970, Clifford Irving contacted his publisher and said that he'd received the blessing of reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes to write his biography, with signed letters from Hughes himself to confirm. The publisher immediately wrote up the contract, gave Irving a $765,000 advance, and by 1971 had a manuscript they were all ready to publish the next year. There was just one problem. Clifford Irving had never actually met Howard Hughes. Questions about the book's authenticity surfaced around this time, culminating with a televised conference by Hughes, with the man himself appearing solely as a voice over the phone, denouncing Irving as a fraud. Investigation traced the 765 grand to a Swiss bank account in the name of one Helga R. Hughes, which was eventually revealed to be Irving's wife, Edith. In the end, Irving confessed and pled guilty to fraud along with his wife and his co-conspirator, Richard Suskind. All this was happening just as Wells and Reichenbach were beginning to edit their footage together, so naturally they immediately began incorporating these events into their film. What would have been a simple biopic widened in scope to become the long-form cinematic essay on truth and lies we have today. I call this an essay because the actual biographical element ultimately serves as a springboard for a larger discussion about the importance, or lack thereof, of authenticity in art. In doing so, Wells went beyond the parameters of a standard documentary by including himself in the proceedings. The film is thus, in a sense, as much about its director as it is about its subjects, if not more so. One shouldn't forget that Wells himself has had a career steeped in lies. In fact, one could say that he wouldn't have had one if it weren't for them. Orson Wells got his first professional acting job at the age of 16 while he was traveling in Europe. Running low on money, he walked into Dublin's famous Gate Theatre, announced himself as a famous American actor on Broadway, and demanded a part. Which he got, his bravado having impressed the theatre's manager. But his greatest trick came in 1938, when he adapted H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds as a radio play, done in such a way as to mimic an actual news broadcast. The result proved so convincing that many people actually believed Martians had attacked New Jersey. Now, in case you were worried that he would pull something similar in a movie called F for Fake, Here's Mr. Wells' assurance to the contrary. During the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid facts. And yet despite this, we'll soon see that even in documentaries, the truth can be very elusive. Which is kind of the point of the movie. For one thing, there's the aforementioned presence of the filmmakers on both sides of the camera. This is especially odd since ostensibly the film is supposed to be about Elmer and Irving, and yet we have scenes of Wells and company attending one of the artist's lavish parties at his home in Ibiza. 
One would think that they would want to keep some distance from their subject to prevent at least the appearance of bias. Although, considering that François Reichenbach had, in an earlier life, been one of the art dealers who, by his own admission, had bought some of Elmer's paintings, that may have been impossible from the start. Come from it. I didn't try to investigate too much, but I kept Why it. didn't you? Like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> because they were very... I didn't want to... You didn't want to know! <laughs> too much. <laughs> Another source of distrust comes from the way the film was put together. Unlike a standard documentary, Effort Fake has a very stream of consciousness, rapid fire style in its editing, something that was quite groundbreaking at the time and especially unheard of in the genre it is considered a part of. The film constantly flashes both back and forth, assembling a collage of images into a kind of cubist version of a documentary, all angles visible at once. And yet by doing this, Wells is also engaging in a kind of cinematic sleight of hand which threatens at times to contradict his earlier statement on the film's veracity. Jean Godard once said, Film is truth 24 times a second, and every cut is a lie. In which case, F for Fake has more lies per minute than most hyper-edited action movies do today. He also said that cinema is the greatest fraud in the world. You can take from that what you will. One thing that is certainly true is that in cinema, and especially in documentary cinema, the editor has one of the most important roles in a film's creation. We've known this since the early 20th century, thanks to the experiments of Russian filmmaker Lev Kulichov, whose work on the effect of montage and editing on the emotional tenor of the image bears his name to this day. Just by assembling a sequence in a particular order, you can change everything about it, regardless of what was actually filmed. Your average nature documentary, for instance, usually films several different animals over the course of its production, then edits the footage together to create the illusion of a single animal for narrative purposes. And speaking of animals, this is also how so-called reality TV works. Half of everything you see is completely out of context, and the other half is usually reenacted to make it more dramatic. These techniques are all put to use here, although nowhere near as abusively. The interviews with Elmir, Irving, and others are more often than not intercut with each other, giving the impression that the people involved are conversing, when in reality the interviews occur days or even weeks apart. This is often done for comic effect, with one person completing another sentence whenever it might be amusing, which is most of the time. The humorous editing gives the film a very light and mischievous tone, which ultimately works well with its subject matter. Which isn't to say that the movie's message isn't worth taking seriously. The concept of authenticity is extremely important when you keep in mind that what makes a particular piece of art valuable is very often not just who made it, but also its rarity. The Mona Lisa in the Louvre is unique and therefore worth a hell of a lot more than, say, the poster version someone might have on their wall. In this sense, forgeries diminish the value of the original by flooding the market with copies that, to the untrained eye, appear to be the genuine article. Which is why for art as business to work, expert opinions are needed to determine the validity of an individual piece before it can be bought or sold. However, someone like Elmir de Hori throws a spanner in the works by creating fakes that are so good that the so-called experts can't tell them from the real deal. This is compounded by the fact that there's an active demand for such things from art dealers, who can then sell them off to their customers for a hefty profit. And what about Irving? There were plenty of handwriting experts who examined the signatures he provided, and as far as they were concerned, those were all genuine. And that odd conference with an invisible Howard Hughes speaking from who knows where. Was that really him? The reporters who heard him certainly thought so, but we've already seen just how reliable expert opinions can be. Had Irving not eventually confessed, would the truth have ever come out? And if so, whose? It's important to remember that this kind of subjectivity doesn't just apply to the businessmen of the art world, but also to its critics. I mean, what I do on this show is purely based on my own personal, obviously biased opinions, backed with whatever factual information I can dig up. The best I can really do is just be honest about that and hope the end result speaks for itself. Or, I can take a page out of the film's book and start messing with you for the fun of it. After all, it wouldn't be Orson Welles if he didn't have an ace or two up his sleeve. Throughout Effort Fake, there's a running subplot about a rather beautiful woman named Oya Kodar that floats in and out of the movie before finally coming to a head at the film's climax. She's supposed to be the granddaughter of another art forger, one even greater than Elmir, who once scanned Pablo Picasso himself out of several paintings. I say supposed to be because, well, remember what Wells said at the start of the movie? During the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid facts. Those of you who've been paying attention have probably noticed that Effort Fake runs for more than an hour. To paraphrase Wells himself, 
The last 17 minutes, he's been lying his head off. The truth, such as it is, is that Oya Kodar is the co-author of the film along with Welts. She's also the one who conceived of the opening sequence of the film, with herself as bait for the gazing eyes of a bunch of unsuspecting men whose reactions were being recorded without their knowledge, ostensibly the most truthful part of the movie in a certain sense. She was also Orson Welles' girlfriend for 24 years until his death in 1985, and is the manager of his estate to this day. The more you know. Despite having fallen out of mainstream recognition since its release, Effer Fake was and is an important film in the documentary genre, both for the way it was put together and how it approached its subject matter. We can still feel its influence today in the editing techniques it helped popularize, as well as in the work of those cinematic essayists who would follow in Wells' footsteps. Aside from that, it remains an eminently watchable film that expertly uses its cast of characters to examine a complex and intriguing world, with class and wit to spare. Ultimately, it's as much a philosophical statement by Wells on the nature of art as it is a study of fraud and fakery, and as such, offers a tantalizing glimpse into the mind of one of cinema's greatest magicians. Wells draws the curtain on his film with this quote by Pablo Picasso, Art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. Now, what that truth actually is, I'll leave entirely up to you. I'm Bastion, and I'll see you next time on The Couch.